Asato Mari is the most prolific Japanese woman director working in the horror genres today. Her work covers a wide range of topics and ideas, from imaginations of the supernatural to the lived horrors of the everyday. In this digital dialogue, Professor Lindsay Nelson shares her research and thoughts about the director and her films, giving us a generous introduction to one of the most exciting directors of contemporary Japanese horror. An expert on J-horror, Professor Nelson is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and Economics at Meiji University in Tokyo, Japan, where she teaches classes on Japanese cinema and popular culture. Her work has appeared in Japanese Studies, Journal of Japanese and Korean Cinema, and East Asian Journal of Popular Culture. Her first book, Circulating Fear, Japanese Horror, Fractured Realities, and New Media, is available currently from Lexington Books. So let's start out by introducing the director herself. Can you please tell us a little bit of background about Asato and what her career is like in Japanese media industries and how she got her start? Yeah, so Asato Mari was born in 1976 in Okinawa. And she, I think she is well known as somebody who has worked with uh, some of the greats of Japanese horror cinema. She was an assistant on Barren Illusion with Kurosawa Kiyoshi. She also worked with uh, the screenwriter and director Takahashi Hiroshi, who wrote the screenplay for or Ringu and, and other films. She worked with him on Sodom the Killer. And she started making her own films uh, way back in 2004 and began with kind of um, components of popular film series. Uh, she also worked in television. And I think by location was kind of her big break. And this film came out in 2012 and it got a lot of attention at international film festivals. And she was immediately kind of identified as a Kurosawa protege with her, her filmmaking definitely showing a lot of the hallmarks of, of his filmmaking as well. But interestingly, I, I actually think it's an earlier film where you really start, of, start to begin to see her style, which is Gomen Nasai, which I think was released in English as Ring of Curse. And this is a film that stars a, a pop group, an idol group, which like so many of those films could have just been a little vehicle uh, for this pop group, but is actually, I think, quite thoughtful, you know, uh, interesting about how uh, sort of the invisibility of girls and, uh, you know, wanting uh, attention for yourself, wanting to be seen. And we start, we sort of there, I think, begin to see kind of the hallmarks of her style as a filmmaker, but, but by location was definitely uh, more widely seen. And I would say that in a sense, she, she is of the same generation as uh, Ogigami Naoko and Nishikawa Miwa, maybe also Kawase Naomi. These are all uh, women who are in their late forties, early fifties, and kind of came of age at the same time. So, I mean, this prestige that must come with being the protege of Kurosawa, right? Kurosawa Kiyoshi, that must come with both expectations, I would imagine also some access into some inner circles and some avenues of production that maybe, you know, your average person wouldn't have if they didn't have this incredible powerhouse behind you. So can you talk a little bit more about maybe that relationship and how that has either perhaps shaped her trajectory or the way that people talk about her? Yeah, I mean, I think that just looking at how people talk about her, looking at interviews that I have seen with her, this is always mentioned. <laughs> um, the fact that she is a Kurosawa protege is always mentioned. And I think, you know, just looking at her films, it, it is kind of impossible to completely divorce her from Kurosawa. There's definitely a lot of Kurosawa influence there. And yet she is very much her own filmmaker, you know, makes her own choices and, and, and charts her own path. But I think that, you know, she has made a point of, a lot of her films are adapted from novels, but she writes the screenplays herself. And she's, a, you know, very particular as a, a director and a creator. I think at this point, honestly, uh, just looking at some of the interviews surrounding her more recent films, the interviews themselves don't really focus on Kurosawa. It's usually mentioned at the beginning, but she has kind of come into herself enough as a director where now at least she is separate from him. And uh, while you know, people mention him and that relationship has certainly helped her, I think, and opened doors for her, I think now she is very much standing on her own two feet. So certainly at this point, it seems like it's more like sort of, you know, we have to pay recognition to where we, you know, where we come from and then we're like yeah. able to move on uh, and stand yeah. on our own two feet. So you've mentioned influences and, and adaptations. These are two words that set off some light bulbs for me just now. But before we get to that, I think you should probably introduce maybe the scope of her films, um, mm -hmm. what, the, what the flavor of them are, maybe some common themes that happen, maybe some visuals that she seems to be particularly interested over the course of her career so far. 
Yeah, I think she is mostly known for her horror films, but her career has actually been really varied. Uh, She has made, again, very recently, she made a TV drama series called, it was, uh, We're Not Divorced Yet. Um, And it was, it was about, (laughs) um, yeah, I think it was, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was basically about a, a couple that are, you know, miserable and and always fighting and I think there's murder involved <laughs> I haven't Dear. seen it so she's made that she also made uh this movie called Hyoka I think it's called like ice cream uh, or something and uh it's based on the classic literature club series of light novels yes um and that was very much like a, a fluffy teen drama but uh I think movies like By Location and Fatal Frame the movie Gekijo Banzero Under Your Bed her more recent one and the Reiru Onigoko series which she did a couple of um and Gomen Nasai <laughs> and she also did a, a an installment in the Juon uh franchise as well Juon Black Ghost looking a- across those films I think it, the thing that I I definitely notice is Again, kind of similar to Kurosawa, she really, really pays attention to lighting. So many of her shots are either filmed with natural light or what looks like natural light, or this interesting contrast between like kind of golden hour, you know, sort of yellow uh, and golds, uh, or just kind of stark light and shadow. She favors, I I think, a lot of um, just kind of slow movement. So her, her movies are quite contemplative. There are just a lot of long shots um, and kind of a series of shots with not much dialogue or there's a lot of whispering. And in that way, I think a lot of people might describe kind of similar to, to some of Kurosawa's films as well. It might describe her movies as slow. You know, the pacing is, is quite deliberate. Um, they take their time. They can also be, as a lot of Japanese movies based on novels are, quite talky. There, there can be a lot of explaining <laughs> uh, and characters kind of telling you who they are rather than showing you but it's it's there and I think it it stems from the, the the novels themselves overall I would say that her her movies also even though they might be classified as horror they're not necessarily scary they're not in the same category as like the ring and Jew on or dark water they are ghostly and spooky but they're not really going for terror. Uh, They're more about, um, you know, the the kind of sense of creeping dread, which I think is a feature of a lot of Japanese horror in general. But even compared to typical Japanese horror films, I think her films are a little more subdued. They're horror, but they're not super scary, (laughs) I think. Wonderful observations on her style and especially these particularities of the techniques that she uses. And then I want to ask you also about larger thematic ideas as well. But I have noticed in particular that her lighting is rather exquisite. I I really enjoy the way that she lights her scenes and clever too. There's in, in Fatal Frame, <laughs> there's a lot of these golden hour shots, but then she has to incorporate those warm lighting tones with this ghostly hand that's happening at the same time. And sometimes e- even at the moment of contact between a face and a hand. So there's yeah, so much you see that the hand is white and the face is yellow. Is yeah. this gold? Yeah. So there's a lot of craft uh, going on w- with her technical abilities, or at least with the team that she's working with. I'm, I'm surprised about the pacing. I, I do find that some of her films are a little bit on the slow side, perhaps, but I thought that the pacing of Under Your Bed was fantastic. Actually. Yeah, Under Your Bed was a little different. Yeah. I think it, yeah. it moved a little more like a suspense thriller uh than than some of her other stuff yeah yeah it's it builds a sense of dread for me that is key to the film where the pacing itself was part of me at one time feeling like this is an innocent human being who's just sort of been overlooked by the world and and bless his heart and that oh no he's actually a monster right and it, it all happens in the pacing where and it had me off kilter the entire time because I could never align myself with any character (laughs) in that film. So yes, the the craft is marvelous. Can you speak some more about the overarching themes that you might see between pieces of her work, even even though she sometimes goes off into, you know, more light height or fair? Yeah. I mean, I think that she, like a lot of women directors in Japan, has repeatedly said, you know, that she she doesn't set out to make women's films and that she doesn't, you know, think of herself first and foremost as a woman director. And yet she does acknowledge that it's different (laughs) uh, being a woman director and making films as a woman. And so I think in her films too, yeah, you can see that there is usually a focus on women. (laughs) Um, And of course, that's not something that is unique to women directors, but there's a focus on women that is 
I think quite multifaceted and that, that just goes a bit deeper um, and that looks at a lot of different angles of women's lives. And in particular, I think the challenges of having to be multiple things uh, to multiple people, we see this in bilocation. I think we see it in uh, Under Your Bed. We see it in Fatal Frame. The idea that as, as a woman, whether you're a housewife, whether you're a young woman, whether you're an artist, that you are, are constantly being forced to switch roles. And in bilocation, I think this the metaphor comes across most dramatically where you have these actual doppelgangers and this idea that, you know, these women are, are split and that one version of them is kind of the domestic and the other version of them is the artist. And they ultimately find it impossible uh, to reconcile the two. And so I think that that comes through in a lot of her films. And I think like a lot of classic Japanese horror films, you, you get this dual horror where there's the supernatural scariness, but there's also just the everyday horror of mm. trying to make sense of your life as a woman and trying to deal with, you know, the everyday pressures and fears and anxieties of, of being a woman in contemporary Japan. Yeah, well, we certainly see that in under your bed for sure. Um, <laughs> it has no, la yeah, no laughing matter there. It's just sort of like mm -hmm. a nervous giggle that I have about that because that movie is so intense. But I think also metaphorically, right, there's something like Fatal Frame where the, the mother figure, the nun, the principal who's running mm -hmm. this school is really anything but a mother. Those dual roles, that duality, those all the burdens that are being placed upon you. I'm wondering, you know, that Asato probably has been in this position herself to be a director who's working in industries. People probably ask her about being a woman director. As you said, ask her if she makes films that would speak to the female experience. And, and being in that double bind of saying, you know, no, because there's an incredible risk to mm. branding, typecasting, and creating a, a stir of rhetoric if you do that. And then you know, wanting to make those stories anyways, and, and to some extent not being able to help yourself from telling those kinds of stories or being interested in them. And so I'm wondering within the particular genre of horror, since you are a horror expert, mm -hmm. if there's something that Asato brings to the horror genre that we're just not seeing, perhaps by directors of a different genre, of a different gender. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think there is a larger conversation happening right now about women making horror, because in the last 10 years in particular, we've seen a lot of films uh, from France, from Australia, from the United States by women that are kind of reimagining certain horror standards and, and tropes. And uh, I think one of the fundamental questions there is, you know, are certain things different when they are made by women rather than men. And of course they're different, but how are they different? And is it is it valuable, you know, to take some you know, tropes or, or storylines that might seem kind of tired, but then reimagine them uh, with a woman director? And I think for, for Asato, like uh, for a lot of other women directors who make horror, there are sort of weird barriers that you run up against. And uh, one of them is just the preconception of what a woman's horror film looks like. So even, I, I think, you know, this happened to, to Julia de Cornau as well, who made Raw um, and Satan, where people would just say to her, you know, oh, I, I saw a softness in your film. Mm. And, and she, her reaction was always like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, there's no softness. Mm -hmm. um, and that Asato as well, when she made Under Your Bed, uh, one of the comments she said from, I think somebody at an audience screening, or maybe it was a critic, said, this doesn't seem like a woman's film. To which, you know, well, okay, well, what does a woman's film look like? And sure. I think it's quite obvious that if these people had seen either of these movies and had not known they were directed by women, they wouldn't have said that. They wouldn't have had really any comment on, on the gender of the filmmaker, but because they know that these movies were made by women, they already have a lens uh, through which they're looking at the films. And so I think for Asato, one of the challenges has been just to get past the bias that people already have in assuming that because she's a woman making horror, it's going to be a certain type of horror mm. film. Mm. And I, I think that for the most part, she has managed to kind of transcend the, the label, um, whether you like it or not, of, of woman horror filmmaker, at least in, in the conversations I've seen with her about her films, she has managed to mostly direct the focus to the films. I think it's been a little more challenging with Under Your Bed, just because that is such a very specific film about a very specific topic 
that mm-hmm. not many women have covered. And she did talk about that. I mean, she did talk about how the filming particular scenes, the particular scenes of violence uh, and working with that actress uh, in the film was probably a very different experience for both her and the actress than it would have been, you know, it, working with a male director. But uh, yeah, I think it just, uh, it shows how for women directors in general and definitely for women horror directors, there's this paradox of not wanting to be known for your gender, but of course being unable to escape it and and wanting to separate yourself from that label, but also you know having to acknowledge that your approach is different um, and that working with a mostly female crew, which she often does, is also different. Yeah, and I might add to that that these stories need to be told too, right? Sure. Like it's there's there's also that as well, you know, in the sort of great erasure of trying to approach things from one subject position right we're like Mm -hmm. losing out on that incredible insight in the stories that need to be told that haven't been told because people from that subject position haven't had access to being able to tell them yet which is always my frustration with this 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 sort of denial (laughs) this attitude that people take publicly but I'm I'm wondering about this sort of stereotyping of of women who make horror films as there's like Mm -hmm. a perceived softness because mm-hmm. yeah yeah you know people are reading gender into it do you think that they're they're saying that just because it's coming pre-packaged with some notion that like oh yes there must be femininity here or is it yeah. is it something about the story that they're picking up on or is it something about the way that the it's shot or is it just like a total rhetorical fabrication <laughs> and, I mean, yeah you know I mean I think I think really 99% of it just comes from the fact that this is a movie made by a woman and that, mm. and that that fact is known before yeah. people watch the movie. And there, there's a, a recent compilation that came out um, called Women Make Horror, uh, edited by Alison Pierce, uh, which came out in 2020. And one thing that, that she says is basically, if you are a woman filmmaker, you are ascribed a political position regardless of personal belief. So people will, will label you in a certain way, regardless of how you feel. And so she and the, and the other writers in this compilation talk about the fact that a, a horror film made by a woman isn't always feminist. <laughs> there, there's, I think there's this other idea that if you're a woman making horror films, they must be feminist. Um, but no, that's not the case. And men may make feminist horror films. <laughs> that yes. happens too. Yeah. And so they, they kind of came up with this uh, manifesto within this Women Make Horror book, which, which was, among other things, included the idea that horror films don't need to be demarcated as either national cinema or feminist or Hollywood to be worthy of study. So I think it, it was more just about correcting a lot of the preconceived notions that people have about women making horror. So yeah, in terms of, of Asto's films and people's kind of reactions to them, I, I have to think that that so much of that just comes from knowing that this was directed by a woman. So if we can throw those, you know, uh, preconceived notions out the window, right, it, it, to the best of our ability, right, because um, we might do that subconsciously anyways, is there anything about her filmmaking that does this does strike you as bringing something new to the table i i think of the ending of by location which made me cry and in in a way that i don't think i don't know that i've ever cried at a horror film before <laughs> yeah. um, i don't cry much at films at all but I, uh, yeah i it, there there was something that touched me so deeply with the ending of that film as well as you know sort of an even small moment that happened in under your bed where when he first begins to start watching her from across the street and realizes that she has a a newborn. He has this comment about how her entire day is shaped by looking after this small child and that Mm -hmm. everything that she does is her her being trapped within this space. He thinks Mm -hmm. at first is because she's doing all the main, um, the the care for this child. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, I just don't, know that I've heard many people have that insight of like Hmm. what really can determine um, a young mother's day Mm -hmm. right that she that that every moment of her day is um, Mm -hmm. you know focused and structured around this other small human being so it's like little moments like that where I go oh all right yeah we have somebody with a different you know sort of a different um, knowledge base here so I mean Mm -hmm. about your do you find moments like that as well Sure. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that to a certain extent, every filmmaker's perspective is shaped by their experiences. And of course, women's experiences are different from men's in many ways. Um, and, and they overlap in many ways, but they're also different. And so 
when you have a woman director making a film about a woman's lived experience, of course, it's going to, I think, show more depth and more complexity. Uh, if I, and I honestly don't know a great deal about Asato's uh, domestic situation if, if she herself has has children, but you know, just the reality of, of, for example, being a teenage girl, which we see in in Fatal Frame, and the things that you talk about, the things that you worry about, and that film in particular, I feel like historically when we've seen films directed by men that focus on teenage girls, of course, for one thing, they tend to sexualize them, which I think doesn't really happen in Fatal Frame. Although I, there, there's a sensuality there, but it's quite different um, from yeah. the usual sexuality we see with high school girls. And I think just the, the kinds of conversations they have are perhaps more based in reality. Uh, you know, they, they, they talk about the things that, that young girls actually talk about. And Asato has said herself that she made a point in that film of actually casting teenage girls, where a lot of directors will cast, you know, 20 or 22 year olds to play 16 year olds. She said, no, I, I want to cast actual teenage girls because they they look different, they act different. And, and they do, I think it comes across, you know, they, they have a, a certain amount of rawness or vulnerability maybe that older actresses don't have. And with Under Your Bed as well, I think just the focus on this woman's day-to-day -day experiences, you know, yeah, being trapped in this house, you know, her every movement kind of centering around, if not the baby, the home, and just, you know, being very limited in this space. And the fact that, you know, both of the, those films are based on novels, one of them, uh, Under Your Bed, a novel written by a woman, I think, yeah, just just adds depth um, to those depictions and adds a, a perspective that historically we haven't seen as often. So we just, we just get more, I think. We get more details, we get yeah, more specificity yeah. sometimes. So I'll sort of lean us away from gender, perhaps just a little bit, although it's so so linked in many ways. So I've noticed that in Asato's films, we have this a lot of obsession of voyeurism and looking that seems to come up, at least in the ones that I've seen so far. Cameras, you know, the, the role of the camera within the, the film itself and representation of cameras. So I'm wondering if you would like to speak about that at all, if, of your observations about the gaze or looking um, voyeurism, scopophilia that happens in her films. And maybe too, like every time I get distracted by me looking at the looking, mm -hmm. I also notice the role of sound that um, is playing mm -hmm. a, an incredible yeah. role paired with that uh, visual mm -hmm. intense, intense looking that's happening in your film. So mm -hmm. if you could speak to, to those things, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I like you said, I think definitely in Under Your Bed and in Fatal Frame, there is this focus on looking and photographs, photography, kind of the, the nature of the image. And uh, in by location as well, you know, we have the main character is an artist who is trying to accurately recreate what she sees and is frustrated when she can't do that. And then of course, you know, it's a, a situation where what you see may not be real, you know, what you're you're seeing, is it the real person or is it the doppelganger? Um, and then in, in Fatal Frame as well, you have a twin situation where is it is it the ghost or is it the person? And then in Under Your Bed, there there's a, a stalker, a voyeur who, you know, is is we're seeing the world through his camera in a sense. And he's seeing this woman, not only through his camera, but through his own very twisted perspective. And by the end of the movie, we really don't know how accurate anything we've seen is because it was his version of this woman that he developed in his head. And we don't know, I think I, I question even that the, the later version of her was accurate because I, you know, I wonder, did he create this, this completely destroyed version of her so that he could come in and rescue her? So I think that all of these films, you know, uh, touch on the sort of fallibility of, of the gaze and of the image and how it's, you know, it seems to reveal, but it actually obscures. And in, in Fatal Frame, you know, we have this kind of idealized uh, image of a girl that turns out to be not at all what we thought it was. And in uh, By Location, you know, we have this kind of picture perfect image of a life that is actually fractured and splintered. And then in, I think that the metaphor gets even heavier in Under Your Bed, where we actually have in this stalker's living space, he has put up massive photo of this woman that is made of like 20 pieces of paper. 
uh, put together that occasionally flutter in the wind, um, right. which just shows kind of the fragmented nature of his own gaze. And interestingly, Asato said, because uh, I think some, some, a lot of people have commented on that in interviews, and she was just kind of like, yeah, that was actually just kind of a budget issue. <laughs> <laughs> because it was going to be really expensive to print out one massive photo. So instead we used paper, but she admits she's like, yeah, but then when I saw it, I thought, oh, cool, this works really great. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. All of her films really are very aware of the nature of, of looking and the gaze and perspective and, and the fallibility of the image. And it, and it, because she is herself such a careful filmmaker and such, you know, someone who is really has honed her craft. I think it makes sense that she would, you know, put a lot of emphasis on that theme. Yeah, and, and what do you make about sound in her films as well? There's so yeah. I mean, it seems she's inherited this mm-hmm. legacy sometimes of limited sound and absolute yes. sound and and very yeah. careful, uh, yeah, sound design in her films. Yeah, so I, I've talked a little bit about this in in Fatal Frame, this idea of haptic visuality and mm. the way that. Um, you know, the sound is kind of, or Im- images are kind of like organs of touch. And then also mm. um, her, her very careful use of sound in that film of whispers, um, of a ticking clock, uh, certain kinds of repeated sounds um, that create this, this kind of tapestry within the film. And that, I mean, that's something that I think Japanese horror has always done quite well, is this very sparing use of both music and repeated sounds to, you know, give kind of an atmosphere of creepiness. And I think that uh, you can you can see it in, you know, Kurosawa movies like Pulse with the kind of the sound of dial-up internet, and in Ringu with you know, this kind of spare soundtrack and the sound of like, you know, TV static and things like that. Interestingly, I feel like in Under Your Bed, it's used to very creepy effect because in Under Your Bed, of course, there are plenty of visually horrifying scenes in that film, both of domestic and sexual violence, but there are also just really horrifying sounds. And some of the the scenes of sexual violence, we don't see it, but we hear it. And that to me is in a way worse (laughs) because it it forces you, the viewer, to, to... put the image in your head. Yeah, there's this moment that pairs the horror of sound and the horror of looking exactly for me as I was watching it. So he's he's listening to these sounds of of sexual assault and then just sexual activity which is also be, being forced. And he's listening to them. We see it happening first and we hear the sound and then we cut to him listening through his headphones because he's set up a device in their house. And he's just sort of, I think, looking at the wall, looking at her picture, I think, on the yeah. wall. But yeah. the way that it's shot, it's the profile sort of medium close up shot, but if it's just mm-hmm. him. We don't see the picture with his earphones, just sort of gazing at, at some, you know, an image. And I realized in that moment, you know, I'm sitting here with headphones on and I'm just sort of gazing at this image yeah. of this and, and hearing the sound. It makes you complicit. This, yeah, it makes you complicit. I'm this guy for a uh, first, yeah. you know, for a split <laughs> second. You know, watching this ostensibly for my entertainment or or what, why ever I'm watching this. Yeah. yeah, so this is just like this perfect moment that illuminates how horrifying it is to, you know, be listening to somebody's trauma and anguish and pain. And yet, is that not what we're doing in cinema all the time? Yeah, I'll just say that when it comes to both uh, the visualization and the the sound of of all the violence and in particular uh, sexual violence in this film, I think that this is part of the larger conversation that's been happening uh, in terms of how much should you show. Um, and I think the, the recent conversation in both TV and film has been, you know, enough already. We're tired of seeing these very graphic depictions of Mm. rape in film and television, mainly because historically those scenes and those plot lines have mostly been used as kind of a lazy shortcut for male character development. You know, that this female character is raped and this is the catalyst for the male character's development. Um, And also just that that the, the graphic visual depiction of rape was an easy way to shock. And that it's not shocking anymore. It's it's quite old. And so I think for a lot of filmmakers, the tendency now is to not show as much, or at least to show it in a different way, to show it more from the perspective of the victim than the attacker. And this is something that I think Jennifer Kent did in The Nightingale and that Coralie Farge did in Revenge. And so when it comes to that with, with Under Your Bed, I have very mixed feelings about the sort of in your face nature mm of the sexual violence scenes in that film because 
on the one hand, I, I, I kind of liked the way it began, which is that we weren't going to see it. It, mm. it seemed like in the, from the beginning, we were only going to hear it or see a very limited perspective of it because we were only going to see it from his perspective. But then it kind of shifts and about halfway through the film, it's like, no, we're going we're gonna to show you everything. Yeah. We're going to throw it in your face. And Asato has actually said for her several times uh, when she gave uh, like talks after screenings of this film, that women came up to her after the talks and they were crying and they mm. said, thank you so much mm. for showing everything because it proved to me that I wasn't crazy. Mm. to actually see it because it's mm. always been hidden to actually mm. see it so bluntly depicted was revelatory for me and that was something I really hadn't considered the mm. idea that that showing something that for these women at least had always been hidden mm. could be meaningful mm. and having it shown in a very particular way I think mm -hmm. that you know wasn't necessarily like sensationalizing it or glorifying mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that adds another layer to that conversation, I think, about, you know, if you're going to show it, how do you show it and, and how do you make it meaningful? And for me, at least, I, I don't know that it was meaningful. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't necessarily think it, it was necessary to show all of that. And she, she also said that her goal in the film was to show the everydayness of sexual violence and mm -hmm. domestic violence and how it, it just became routine and mundane. And that to me too, I, I don't think happened because the, the, the perpetrator was just always a monster. Mm. Th there was nothing mundane about him. It was right. like, th there was nothing redeeming about him. And I thought that, you know, if you wanted to show the everydayness of it, we would have seen him behaving more everydayish. but we never did. We only saw him behaving as, as a, a right. psychotic killer or something. Right. So if any, and you're talking was, about, you're was, talking about the husband here. Yes. Yes. yes the husband. Yeah. 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 So that was her, that at least was some of her thought process on that. Yeah. I struggled that I had the exact same impression myself and I struggled with this too, in the sense that I thought, well, I don't really want this husband who's a monster to become a more fully fleshed yeah. figure because I, I you know, True. I want what he's doing to be monstrous, I guess, in the way yeah. that Asato was, was, intending as well. But you're right, it is a two-dimensional representation of that monstrosity yeah. that, mm. you know, lends us to thinking more like, well, why doesn't she just leave? Because it doesn't exactly. give you that, it doesn't give you that other aspect of yes. the um, toxic, violent, powerful yes. relationship that at least at first keeps somebody there yes. right and mm -hmm. so um you're right yeah i i felt that that was missing as well but then i also grappled with it because i thought that would that would detract from the point especially yeah. since it's being told from our yeah. our voyeur's it's perspective sweet. who's yeah, not focused on the husband he's yeah. only focused on her right but yeah. i felt that way i was thinking about haptics and fatal frame that you that you just mentioned and then under your bed too and these really hard scenes that I will probably never watch again, but the, her body is so destroyed and so bruised and the makeup that they've done to her to visualize that, that every time she is touched, I cringe. So there was a way that she shot that and created it that made me feel that character's pain at being even yeah. just touched lightly, I think. I don't know yet how to describe exactly what technique it is that, yeah. that did that, but that haptic reality, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was expressed visually. Honestly, the, the moment where we cut from, mm -hmm. I think it's just a kind of everyday scene with Mitsui to mm -hmm. then just a, sh a full body, full frontal shot yes. of her naked and yeah. covered in bruises is quite honestly one of the most horrifying things I have ever seen. And mm -hmm. like, you know, you we can argue about whether Under Your Bed is a horror film or a thriller, but right? to me, it's absolutely a horror film because it is, that is truly a horrifying image. And just the way that the camera just lingers there. Yeah, it, it just, as, as some of the women who saw the, the film comment, it just shows everything. Yeah, that from then on, every time she is touched, you remember all of those bruises and all of those injuries and just, yeah, her body becomes this sort of, you know, pathway <laughs> for the, the viewer yeah. to, to really yeah. connect with that. And it's, it, it is deeply horrifying. Oh yeah. Um, so you, you, you've already mentioned in passing that she's drawing on this J-Hor uh, movement, the stylization that you know so much about. And this struck me as well when I was watching 
several of her films, but I think in particular Fatal Frame, I see it the strongest where, I, you know, at one moment I'm watching it and I'm thinking, ah, yes, Ringu. And then <laughs> another moment I was like, ah, yes, here's Loft. Um, and I think Under Your Bed, there was a moment where I thought, ah, yes, this is audition, um, but it's actually, yeah. Yeah. you know, fl flipped around in a certain way. So, um, you know, I, is she being cheeky maybe, or to what extent uh, are you seeing this influence of J-horror in her films? I'm sure, you know, given who she has worked with, obviously uh, the influences are there. Interestingly, when in interviews, when she is asked about her influences, this is something that, that I think kind of puts her in the boys club in a way is that when people like Takahashi Hiroshi and uh, Kurosawa Kiyoshi and Nakata Hideo are interviewed about, you know, their sort of filmmaking background and how they came to filmmaking and their, their sort of formative influences, they all tend to list the same group of people. And it's kind of like they all went to the same school and read the same magazines. And, and Takahashi Hiroshi actually has very casually says like, yeah, you know, when, when I was in junior high, all of us, you know, we read uh, the, the French film magazines and we all went to, and I'm just kind of like, oh, really? That that was just a thing. That you sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. But yeah. they all mention, you know, French New Wave. They they talk about people like Peter Weir and, and Picnic at Hanging Rock. They mention Toby Hooper. They talk about uh, The Haunting of Hill House. And so it's this very specific group of like 19, late 1960s, early 1970s atmospheric horror. But I think that, so Asato her, says the same thing when, when she's asked about her influences, those are, are the people that she mentions. And then for Under Your Bed, she very specifically said that she um, was influenced by Blue Velvet, um, mm. particularly in the, a lot mm. of the, the sex scenes. So I think that she, like a lot of Japanese horror filmmakers, when you look at a lot of her, her shots and, and her structure, of course, she is part of a long tradition of, of J-horror filmmakers who are kind of pulling from the same bag of tricks, but who are also very much drawing on these foreign filmmakers uh, that they admire so much, who also had a thing for certain kinds of music and certain kinds of lighting and certain kinds of spooky atmospheres and things like that. So yeah, I, I, I don't know that, I, I don't necessarily see her like satirizing it or mm. making a parody of it, at least not yet, but it's there. I mean, she is clearly, you know, a descendant of, of these, these films uh, that, that were so influential. Yeah. I mean, Psycho, this under your bed is in, yeah. in, in many ways drawing on Psycho, right? And yeah. To, to not dressing up a skeleton, but dressing up a, a mannequin. I think that's fascinating that you, you have these directors, they know each other, they're in conversation with each other, obviously, and they've, they've sort of agreed on the, um, mm. the list of influences that might make them look. <laughs> the best. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, I don't want to say them. like, I, I don't I don't want to claim that they like they have self manufactured their own director personas or anything. I actually do think that you know for a certain generation of Japanese filmmakers, yeah, there there was a kind of group there there and yeah. you know it, it was based they were they were kind of and Kino Stachika has talked about this as well. They they were reading the same magazines, they were yeah. watching the same movies, and so even if they didn't know each other at the time, it's not too far-fetched to imagine that, you know, a certain group of men of a certain age, you know, kind of came into film the same way through the same group of directors. And obviously Asato is younger than them, but I can see how, you know, if they were, you know, first her mentors and they, they might've said, you know, oh, you need to check out this movie you need to check out this movie that she might have, you know, learned about filmmaking through a lot of the same films that, that influenced them. For people that are new to Asato's work, which is, might be quite a lot of people, um, where would you recommend that they start and, and where might they go from there if they want to approach her works? I, I think By Location is probably her best film and by, by far her, her meatiest film, just in terms of the uh, the craft and, and the, the subject matter that it deals with. So that's the one I would definitely recommend if you want to watch just one uh, Asato film. I, I think Fatal Frame is also really interesting in terms of, it, again, really interesting craft. And, and just kind of a signature Asato style. Under Your Bed is an interesting film. It comes with a massive trigger warning. <laughs> um, I don't recommend watching this film if, if you are uh, squeamish about uh, any forms of violence or gore or domestic or sexual violence. That it, That's a rough bar to clear, honestly. But I, I, I do think it's an interesting film uh, to look at. But definitely, I would say Biolocation is probably her most important film. Well, thank you, Lindsay, so very much for your time and for speaking with me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs>